So we have here today Professor James Williams, Professor Emeritus at Syracuse University, who has kindly agreed to talk to us and share his memories of uh, René Girard and how he met René Girard and uh, how he started working with René Girard and what kind of impact uh, René had on Professor Williams. So let me start off by asking you, uh, Professor Williams, how did you first hear about Professor René Girard? Well, I think I first heard about him in France. I was in France in 1985 and I was in, invited to give a lecture to the Catholic Theological Faculty at the University of Strasbourg. And it was on the uh, conflict between brothers in the book of Genesis. And after my paper, one of the members of the faculty, um, Raymond Kunzmann was his name, as I recall, he said, you know, you should read René Girard. And I said, all right, well, I sort of kept it in mind. And a day later, or two days maybe, I happened to be in a bookstore in Strasbourg and was browsing the shelves and there in front of me, about at my eye level, was a book by René Girard. It was, um, uh, La Violence et le Sacré, Violence and the Sacred, one of his most important books. And I said, aha, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start reading this. <laughs> and so I started reading it. I was just in Strasbourg for three years, and I didn't finish. Um, actually, I misunderstood him at first, maybe because it was French, or I just hadn't read far enough and didn't didn't completely understand anyway. I thought that um, he was saying that the scapegoat mechanism is really a, a kind of good thing. Later on, as I kept reading, and then I got the book in English and read, and I discovered that scapegoat mechanism, actually, it turned out, was a beneficial thing to some extent because it allowed communities to survive and not people not to kill each other, but they all could agree on uh, eliminating the scapegoat. But nonetheless, in the long run, um, if you talk about good and bad or good and evil, you would have to call it basically an evil mechanism that works for a while. Of course, you have to keep the scapegoating going. So that was in 1985. And, and then in 1987, I was uh, in Sonoma, California for a conference. And um, I was invited by uh, one of Gerard's colleagues, Bo uh, Robert Hamilton Kelly, who was just Bob Kelly and Rene Gerard and me having lunch together. And it was, um, there was nothing spectacular about it. Um, he seemed a little bit shy at first, but uh, it was basically pleasant. I'd already had a bit of correspondence with him. I, I, when I came home, I wrote to him, and uh, I may have sent him the off-print of an article that I'd published in which it, it was not really about him and his work, but I mentioned his work in, in the article, and he wrote me back a nice message in his... Uh, um, typical kind of script. It starts up here and then it slants downwards <laughs> to the right. <laughs> and uh, he thanked me and congratulated me and thought I was on the right path. Of course, he was particular, in, particularly interested in the, the question of violence. I didn't deal with that entirely. It was an article on the Sermon on the Mount, as I recall. But that sort of started, we had an occasional correspondence before we met. And um, so the event I had attended in Sonoma was the West Star Institute. Uh, uh, there were three seminars going on. One was the Jesus Seminar. Another friend, Charles Maybe, and I started a, another seminar in the, the West Star meetings. And we invited Renee in 1988. 
And um, we had him for that spring seminar three straight years. Um, in 1990, I had a leave from Syracuse University. Um, and um, so I, I, my wife and I packed up our car and drove to California, stopping to visit different people on the way because I had a sabbatical leave. I was not in, her, in a hurry and arrived in uh, Palo Alto about the middle of January. And so uh, we were there until about the middle of April. Uh, I got to, I along with three Danish scholars who were there, um, who became friends with me. We attended Rene's course on Shakespeare. So I got to know him and, you know, by the end of the time there, uh, you know, I don't know that it was a close friendship at the time, but it was it was sort of on the way. And um, um, he impressed me with his writing and his lecturing. He always, even in the Shakespeare course, that you had him, you had him for some courses, right? Absolutely. And he started out always seemed a little bit shy at first, and then he started really warming up and before too long, you know, his passion, his excitement began to show. And he was really a, a, really a good lecturer because the Shakespeare course had students ranging from underclassmen to upperclassmen. And um, it seemed to be always fully attended. There were about 125 in an auditorium there uh, on the Stanford campus. And um, um, that was, of course, those lectures, um, went into his book on Shakespeare that was published not long after that. Uh, so that's how I met him. We, um, Yvonne was with me. We met Martha, his wife, and um, it was a start of a uh, of, uh, really, really warm and fruitful friendship, I must say. When did you start uh, translating? You translated quite a bit of his work. Yeah. Um, See, I first translated um, the work on Dostoevsky, and that that was published. I don't think that was published. Yes, I don't think that was published until 1997. I probably started on that in 1995. Of course, that that was a short work, and much of it was was already in Deceit, Desire, in the novel, his right. first book. That was a real introduction to Dostoevsky for me. Right. I came to learn about uh, a lot about Dostoevsky, and I, it, it inspired me to read all of his major books, I think, but not only the Brothers Karamazov, the, um, let's see, what else did I read? The Eternal Husband. I don't know, there were four or five of Dostoevsky's books that I read. Um, and so, I mean, that was one of the ways it also, later on, he got me into Nietzsche. And so I read a lot of Nietzsche. Uh, what made you think about the Girard reader? Well, I thought it was a good idea. And I noticed that um, several important scholars had readers and evidently no one had proposed it to Girard before. So um, I made a proposal to him that I do that. And he said, well, that's a good idea. So I started work on that. Um, things happened pretty fast. It was either the end of 1994, or early in 1995. I got his approval. I had all of the um, essays and my introduction and so on. But I think one thing was lacking. I thought one thing was lacking. So I asked him if I could come to interview him. Um, I'd been in his home several times by then, but I think it was May 1996. Could I interview him for a conversation? And so we spent two days, two afternoons recording. Then after I uh, had it typed up, I sent it to him and he, you know, he edited it and I went over it. And see, the, the book was published by the end of 1996, Gerard Reader. And so I think it was a good way to end because it covered a, 
questions not only about essays in the reader, but also about topics that weren't covered in the reader. Right. Um, so well, like uh, the um, scapegoating of kings, and the kings of gods, and um, mimesis as a kind of pre-representational -rep -pre kind of um, uh, kind of intuition in human beings. So in the conversation, I brought up those topics as well as a number of others. Which one of Rod's book is your favorite? Well, I like them all, but I would say that my favorite, well, I have two favorites for different contexts. For overall um, theory covering the foundations of Renee's thought in a, a global way, that would have to be things foundation, uh, things hidden. hidden since the foundation of the world. My favorite book in terms of um, readability and um, practical use is one I translated. <laughs> I see say, Satan. I see, I see Satan fall like lightning. This one. I had to ask him. That's a that's a quotation of a New Testament verse. However, in the in the gospel passage, the C is put in the past tense or maybe an imperfect in Greek. But it's translated, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I asked Renee about that and he said, I thought it was better to put it in the present tense uh, in that I'm you know, sort of trying to see this uh, along with Jesus, you know, uh, contemporize it a little bit. And so I really like that book. And of course I got into it in detail because I had to work hard on that translation. He usually was not concerned about his translations. He told me he almost never went over a translation or at least very thoroughly, but he spent a lot of time with this one. He thought it was very important. And so he, he gave me a lot of uh, changes, most of them minor, and I got some compliments on the translation. I think it came out pretty well. Uh, but, you know, that's a one book I think that is the most readable of his full length works. All these years you knew Rene, did he have uh, any impact on you personally? Um, well, I, you know, Rene was a very religious Catholic, uh, Catholic Christian. He became, he was influential on me as a religious man and just as a good man. Um, when you, you get to know, in fact, you know, he's, he's pretty friendly and warm hearted right away, really, with most people. Um, but um, I think that that had an effect on my, my religious thinking and, and as my attention to things Catholic. I mean, he was raised as a Catholic. So he was, you know, he was born and bred as a Catholic. And I became more of a Catholic because of him. But uh, there's nothing, there was nothing really narrow minded about his Catholicism, you know. And he appreciated people of every stripe as long as he thought they were at least well behaved, if not. <laughs> so, so did you become a Catholic because of Rene? Or, or did you I, I think it had an influence on me because I started reading Rene. Um, after that, uh, that experience lecturing to the Catholic theological faculty, I got the book. So I was reading Rene, and in fact, I'd published, I published an essay in 1987, 1988. It was in a publication that had really book reviews. You could review more than one book of an author. So it was a short, like a five or six page article. And I'd already written one or two things about Rene when we traveled to Palo Alto and settled in and, and met him. Um, and that was what year again? Well, um, actually I had met him in 1987 just uh, over lunch when I traveled down from Sonoma to uh, Stanford, but the, the time of my, the period of my leave was from January to April 
about the middle of January to the middle of April, uh, 1990. So, and that was, that was very important, you know, and it would have been, and I was working, in fact, he gave me his, his, uh, his stall, his carol in one of the libraries. Oh. He had to ask someone else, uh, who was he? He was that Italian fellow. Uh, I can't remember his name now. John Fortero? Uh, but John Fortero? No, no, John I never did mean John Fortero. He, John Fortero wasn't at Stanford then, was he? In 1990? Um, maybe he was. I, I'm not sure. Uh, this, this was a student. This was this was a graduate student who'd come from. He was Italian, but I think he had been working in Germany. I can't remember his name just now. But anyway, I took Renee's Carol, and so every day of the week, um, I drove into Stanford, or sometimes Yvonne drove me, and sometimes she had lunch. I had lunch with the Danes, and Gil Bailey came up from Sonoma. He came from Sonoma to sit in on the Shakespeare class also. Um, so that was, that was a lot of time, uh, and it was very, very profitable. I wrote, while I was there, about a chapter and a half of the book, The Bible of Violence and the Sacred. However, later, I didn't think it was very good, and I completely rewrote it. But um, actually, I had the manuscript for the book finished by the end of 1990, and it was published in 1991 first. Yeah. Wonderful. And um, can you, in closing, can you tell me one or two favorite memories you have of Rene? Well, you know, I have a lot of memories of him. He, first of all, of course, I enjoyed uh, a uh, intellectual discussion with him, but just as a person, he had his own little quirks. You know how early he got up in the morning and, and uh, how he had to be sort of organized at home by his wife, Martha, and so on. Um, you know, you told me that you, we might talk about personal memories. Um, he was a very humble person in a way. Uh, once we were having a discussion and uh, we had been talking about the mimetic scapegoat theory and somehow, I don't know how he got into it, but his reading came up, what he was reading he said, you know, there's some books that I don't like to read, you know, by really important people because I fear I'm scared that I'll find something that'll make me change. And I remember he mentioned specifically Levinas, you know, Emmanuel uh, Levinas. But at any rate, so that was one thing that I, you know, I'm just afraid I'm going to find something that's going to call my theory into question. Now, he has made changes, of course. Another, just a quick antidote, is at that very, in fact, it's, it, the setting was the very time when I was there to interview him. I, I used to have a lot of back and neck trouble. And see, I was there for about four days and over the weekend, I developed a really pen, painful, um, stiff neck. And, um, it's practically incapacitated me. And I uh, mentioned to him, so I told him, I'm sorry, I can't, he wanted to go for a walk or something. Oh, that's too bad. He says, here, let's see if I can help you. And he got around behind me. He started rubbing my neck and my back and giving me a massage. And I thought, hmm, I wonder how many distinguished <laughs> professors <laughs> would do something like that. And also after he gave me a rub, he said, you know, Jean, Jean Michel, or Gurlion. He's always sending me medicine. Let's go in. We have it in a closet. It was in a closet or somewhere at a big watch with all these pills. And I don't know if he gave me something to take uh, to ease the pain. I don't remember what it was, but I took one or two of them while I was there. And so not only did he give me an interview, but he eased my pain. <laughs> but that's the kind of person he was, uh, he seemed to be not very, I don't know, concerned with the everyday world, but there were certain ways in which he was, I don't know, very observant. Like, for example, example, it might have been 
one of our meetings at Stanford when Bob Kelly formed Imitatio. And I was at house and he was being interviewed by someone and I hardly got to see him. And then we had to, we had to walk back to, to, to the university. It was in his home. We had to walk back to the university and he's been taken by car. Uh, but he said to him, oh, Jim, I'm so sorry that we didn't have any time together. And he really not only said it, but he seemed very concerned. And, you know, I always remember that. I mean, I, I felt as though, you know, um, I was a close friend, um, but uh, no one has influenced my thinking more unless, you know, you would call a basic biblical influence from my early days and as a Baptist and a Methodist and finally a Catholic. And we really loved uh, Martha too, actually. And she was the perfect wife for him. I didn't understand the point you were making about Brene was being uh, uh, apprehensive about reading other um, philosophers, you said? Yeah. Does that kind of um, surprise you? Yeah, because uh, he, he was, wasn't he always very confident about the mimetic theory and his thoughts? Well, yes, uh, you know that, and, and you know, this is something he worked on in detail. But on the other hand, he admitted that he was worried that someone would have an insight or a discovery that might cause him to change it significantly, you know, right. not just some right. detail. And so there was a certain, he had not only a certain humility, but he didn't, he didn't have the assumption that he had the world wrapped up in, in his theory, you know. Um, well, that's a good thing then. <laughs> you no, know, yeah, no, I thought it was. He, he read these people, but he said with apprehension. Right. Um, but clearly he learned from a lot of people. Now, I don't know whether he took much from Levy, and he certainly learned from Derrida, right. I think. Right. So because the pharmacon became important sure, for him. Um, from Levinas, I don't know. Right. He certainly had read, um, what was it, God Without Being? Was that the title of the book? Something like that. Right. The, but these, the European thinkers and existentialists associated being with, well, René didn't, René didn't like Bean because he thought the real, the real title of Levinas's book should have been uh, uh, God Without Violence or God Without Sacred Violence. He said that's what Bean was really associated with for Heidegger as well as for Levinas. Yeah. What did you think of his last book, Battling to the End? Uh, it was kind of a surprise, but I thought, you know what, it's a, I really hadn't known about um, uh, Holderlin. I hadn't known that he would, he read that much Holderlin. Um, that was, that was a surprise to me. And um, it, I, I had read some of Holderlin's poetry. I, I, I got a copy, I forget what I read, but, but at any rate, I read more in or about Holderlin after that. But I thought basically it was a good book, especially now that was, that didn't come out in English till 2009, did it? Right. Um, right. But I think he'd given those interviews in 2005, most right. of them. Right. And uh, so, but his, he wouldn't have been sharp enough in 2009 to do that. No, I thought, I mean, and there were, so, there were some new things in that. He was less, he was a less optimistic, Rene. Yeah. yeah. But things began to happen then that they're just really taking fruit now in terms of social and political division, polarization, you know, yeah. in our country. Yeah. yeah. And I think he had a sense that things were different. Right. Right. You know, he was the kind of person, his 
his feelers were always out. Um, and so he had such tremendous focus. And then to get up at three in the morning and or three thirty or whenever and start his work. And then so his courses were in the afternoon. I don't think you ever had a morning course with him, did you? No, they were all in the afternoon. They're That's all correct. in the afternoon. He That's got a well, of course, if you had a meeting with him at mid or late afternoon, he might fall asleep on you, I found <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said something to him about it once. He said, oh, don't, don't, don't take it personally, Jim. It just means your, your conversation is so interesting, it soothes me. And so I fall asleep. <laughs> but I'll save this for him. I attended math, mass with him once or twice. He stayed awake during mass. Yeah. <laughs> and he really was uh, an authentically religious person. That's true. That's true. That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Good. good. Well, well, Jim, thank you so much for taking this time to. It's, it's good to see you and be in contact with you, you as well. I hope you're doing well. 